Um, just a little bit about myself. Um, I grew up in Tiaraha, uh, um, Thames Valley. Uh, my parents are farmers, all my brothers are farmers, and right since I was a little tacker, all I've wanted to be is a motorcycle mechanic. That's, that's all I've ever been interested in, in motorcycles in my life. And, um, and I suppose, relatively typically of, of boys, teenage boys who wanted to be tradespeople, I was always in the back row of the class and I didn't pass anything at school and I, I reached a fantastic deal in the sixth form. I wanted to go and they wanted me to go, so we shook hands and, and that was the end of my secondary school. And I, and I got an apprenticeship um, in Cambridge in a motorcycle dealership, served my time, qualified, and, uh, and left to move to Otterahunga in 1985 when I was 22 and started my first business and I've had a number of motorcycle businesses over the previous 20 years. Retired at 42 and I'm too lazy to work now so uh, so this is kind of what I do as well as uh, the mayoralty and, and work with the Mayor's Task Force and Marcus. And I sort of give you that little bit of context because in the 20 years that I was in my dealerships most of my staff were boys under 25 years old who were rascals, but fantastically gifted technical people. And so I had to learn, because I had multiple dealerships around the central North Island, I had to learn pretty quickly how to work alongside these rat bags and, and motivate them and encourage them and incentivize them to go out in the field unsupervised and, uh, and work for me and help grow my dealerships. And uh, so I sort of learnt a lot over that period. I fostered children for children and young persons for a number of years, so I sort of got exposed to to lots of different um, life experiences and um, got involved in the district council in 1995. I, I bought some land on the edge of town. I wanted to build a new building for one of my businesses and the bank said, we won't give you money unless you do a business plan. I didn't know what one of those were and so I had to do one and it included scoping the, the council and the administration. So I, I did and I didn't like what I saw. They were all old people, they were all retired farmers and everything was wrapped in baling twine and band-aid and I thought, well this isn't going anywhere, so I thought I'd try and get elected and make a difference and then go back to work and, and, and carry on, but I found being on the council was more fun than work, so I thought I'll sell my businesses and, and stay at this for a bit longer, so, so here I am. Oh, sorry. This is a little bit about my rohi, my, my district, uh, about 9,500 people in the district. We stretch from Kafia and Aotea Harbours on the west coast. <coughs> Excuse me, very narrow district, goes right through to Waipapa Dam on the way to Taupo. And uh, about 2,700 in the village of Odo and 300 in Kafia, which explodes to about 5,000 over the summer. One kura, one, one secondary school, 11 primaries, double the national average of Māori, lower than the national average income. Average was what Odo used to, was described by people who came through and also people who lived there for many, many years. I'm glad to say that's changed significantly in recent times. A lot of really strong business people. You know, we're really fortunate. We've got businesses like um, Freight Lines that own the big green trucks and the Inter-Island of Ferries. The Barker family, been in Odo 50 years, they love the place. The Giltrap Group that make the feed-out wagons and <coughs> tractors and so forth. Um, OTC Timber, big finger jointing factory, employs a lot of people. We've got about six businesses that employ about a thousand people. So regardless of the economy, most businesses have about a 5% churn every year. So there's about 50 jobs a year coming on stream regardless of, of uh, who does it, what, what anybody does about it. The issues in 2004 when, when I became the Mayor in October were this. It was the beginning of that really explosive time in the economy. You know, the building boom from 04 to about 08, 09, it was massive. Now, I was still in business in 04, and me and a couple of my friends in our dealerships, we could really, we could feel this coming, this tsunami of, of activity, and we were trying to gear our businesses up to take full advantage. And we were struggling with labour then. And we were really frightened about how that was going to look in another year or two's time. And what sort of crystallised it for me, I got the job in October and I had two of my larger businesses, a couple that I mentioned, come to welcome me and thank me and all the rest. And then in passing they said, well actually we're looking at relocating because the labour market's too tight here. And I'm going, oh my God, I don't want that on my CV, I've just got this job, you know. And then we had two young people commit suicide end of November 04. They were unrelated, but you imagine 
what that did in a community of 3,000 people. It traumatised us. And uh, in the ensuing hui that happened in the lead up to Christmas, because people were frightened about copycats and all sorts of stuff over the break when everybody was was um, off duty. So in, in the hui that came forward, the youngsters said really, really strongly that Odo sucked. There was nothing for them. And, you know, it was all right if you were, if you were Pakia or, or middle class and you could afford uniforms and play rugby and you were into organised sport and, you know, all that stuff. That was fine. But not a few weren't. And one of the things that resonated with me, about two years earlier, I'd gone into the local college and spoke to a group of 16-year-olds in their class. And I remember saying, because I was in business then, I remember saying, What's, what are you going to do when you leave school? And every hand went up and said, we're going to get the heck out of here, because this place is hopeless. Except they didn't say heck, imagine what they said. But anyway, and, and that really disappointed me, because I was an employer and I had my eye on a couple of these kids, but they had already, for whatever influence, they had already worked out they were gone. And, you know, so when the kids were saying this in those hui, I thought, how can this be in a community this small that I know pretty much everybody after 20 years in business here, we have a whole group of resource, young people, who believed there was no opportunity for them in Odo, in the town that they were born in. And on the other hand, we had a massive group of employers saying, where are all the young people? Where's all the resource? I'm thinking, how, how can that exist in a community that small? So where the journey, I call it a journey because like, like a lot of these things, you don't know what you're starting and you don't know where it's going to go. And I hope to goodness now after eight years it never ends because it's, it's wicked. Where it started was a really close friend of mine, Andrew Giltrap, owns one of those dealerships. He and I would get together on a Friday night over a cup of tea and talk about business and life and all that. No, he didn't drink, I did. But anyway, um, <clears throat> and we found we were always saying the same thing. Why were we advertising good, good apprenticeships in our dealership workshops and no kids locally were applying? That's what started this. We didn't sit around and talk about how do we fix crime and world peace. Probably if we had it, we'd still be there talking about it. This was real, selfish and tiny. You know, it was just how do we protect our businesses? So Andrew and I wandered down one day, we got tired of talking about it, went down and met the principal of our, of our college. And there was a couple, just before I sort of launch into this, there was a couple of principles that we had agreed before we began anything. The first was we would accept everything on face value. I mean, I've learned in life that if you, if you ask questions and you don't particularly like the answer, as soon as you then go critical or go on the attack, you've lost it. So we said, whatever we get told or we get exposed to, we'll just take it on board in the way it's offered. And that became useful as we got into this, believe me. The second was we wouldn't put any energy, because we're a couple of business people, we're working really hard to stay profitable, and we agreed we would not put any energy or money or anything into it unless it had direct outcomes for our youngsters. That was the principle. We weren't interested and still aren't in stroking egos or KPIs or any of this bureaucratic nonsense about outputs and you know box ticking and that. I'm just not interested in that. Would, we would only do what made a difference. So, so anyway, we wandered in, met this guy, and he was a principal of our college who lived in a different community, which is not uncommon in the Waikato. A lot of principals live in the centre and they, you know, cover their bases. But as a result, he didn't know a single employer. He didn't know who won, won the rugby on Saturday or where the fire was last night. He didn't consider it a weakness, so I'm just telling you what we found, and I'm not criticising him at all. This is not uncommon. And then we said to, to the principal, what happens when kids in this kura start talking careers? And he said, they go down and meet our careers advisor and it's all good. So we wandered down and met this dude, and he was a weirdo. He was incredibly strange. <laughs> Honestly, he was. He'd been at the school 22 years, and he told Andrew and I, and we were strangers, he told us he didn't actually like kids. <clears throat> Now, I'm not saying this is like this everywhere, but, you know, there's still less than 20 fully qualified careers advisors in 280 high schools in New Zealand. So I would suggest, whilst our case might be extreme, I bet it's not the only one. Well, certainly I'm, well, pretty head's nodding, that's brilliant. <laughs> uh, but, you know, and we were appalled, you know, and I went home and checked with my teenage kids, like, is that for real? And they said, Daddy's a knob, we don't go near him. Well, <clears throat> 
you know, so that was so that was the deal. So we went back and saw Keith and said, like, you know, that's terrible. And he agreed and he replaced them because he wasn't aware of this, and he replaced them with a guy, Wayne, who, what a lovely guy who does like kids. And so we went back and saw him because we thought, well, let's just keep going with this. And we said, so what happens now when when kids talk careers? And he said, well, we've, we've set up this wonderful place in the school library. The kids get the information, show mum and dad, make their selection. It's great. And we said, well, that's brilliant. That sounds fantastic. And uh, so we wanted it and had a look. And this was a light bulb moment for us. Every point of sale material in that careers library was polytechs and universities academia. And Andrew and I looked at each other and said, where's real jobs? You know, where are the jobs that, that power my community? Like those businesses I talked about, they only employ maybe 5% of people with a degree. The rest of the people are tradespeople and, and salt of the earth, you know, people like me. <laughs> but you know, I mean, that was a real light bulb moment for us. Now again, we didn't, we didn't criticise because you know, academia is very good at, at recruitment and, and enrolments. That's what, that's what they do. But we looked at that and said, what have we done as local employers to put ourselves in front of our kids? And the answer was nothing. So we went back, raised some money. With that, we went around the businesses, raised some money, and produced our own brochures. And, um, and again, the principles for us is about what will, what will connect with youngsters. So like our brochures, real glossy, they're real awesome brochures. And they don't talk about, you know, you do a four-year apprenticeship on minimum wage and it's hard work and eventually the light might come on sometime because that's just like dead boring. And so the, the brochures talk about, you know, you become trades qualified in New Zealand and you can travel the world because everybody wants you, which is true. And, you know, you can work for these glamour places like NASA and motor racing teams. Actually, we just say you make a lot of money, you get girls. That's all they want to know. <laughs> But we also talk about how cool it is to live locally and just remind the youngsters that, that they don't have to scarper, you know, this is a really cool place. And then we, we found then that, the, you know, we're proud of ourselves then, and then we found the school was putting our kids on a bus every August and sending them up to the regional careers expos. And that was just three times as many polytechs and unis. And we're thinking, no, we're not exporting our kids. So we set up our own careers expos and we run those each year, about three weeks before the regional ones. And no outside businesses, you know, it's all local and our, like our, our builders all cluster together and there's no boring stuff. So, you know, I used to bring in motorbike engines and tools and kids would rip stuff apart, they'd have a blast, you know. Nothing ever went back together, but it didn't matter. And like, and the other principle at the expos is nobody over 30 on the stalls. So the employers put their apprentices and the youngsters in to tell other kids how cool it is to do what they do. Now, you know, throughout this, I mean, I don't think any of this stuff is rocket science, but when I come to Wellington and meet ministers and officials, they go, oh my God, nobody's ever done that. I think, well, why? Why? Because we're just basic people, you know? We just, we just want what we want and, and seem to understand that stuff gets so complicated so quickly, but it doesn't need to be. And then we, um, we found a redundant trust locally with a lot of money gathering dust, so we, we got hold of them and they put up money each at our Careers Expos for Young Achievers Awards, so we give out money and accolades and acknowledgement to our young people for whatever they're doing that's good, even if we don't understand it, even if it's graffiti or hip hop or something like that, it doesn't matter. If it's good, it's great. And then at one point we found <coughs> youngsters wanting to do an apprenticeship had to go to Polytech out of town to do a pre-apprenticeship course. So we said, no, nah, we don't want that. So we went up, Andrew and I, naive as anything, went up to Wintech, because they were the nearest, the only one we knew, and said um, to Mark Blouse, the CEO, we want a Polytech in Odo. And uh, he just thought we were nuts. And, and, and you know, we had to go through a lot of hurdles. We had to get a building, we had to get a tutor, we had to get evidence of community support. We, and we just, just worked our way through it quietly. The council had a building, the retired head of the, the trades department at the college, lovely guy said i hear what you're up to this is great i'll work for nothing it's and he had letters after his name from here to there and it was great and we got money off the employers because they were wasting money on immigration trying to import people that weren't staying you know so we we chipped our way through and finally <clears throat> this was another light bulb moment for us they finally said yep we'll, we'll give it a year's trial and here are the courses we teach in the trade center at avalon which ones do you want to teach in odo so Andrew and I took them away, read them all, took them back, put them on his desk, and he said, which ones? And we said, none, they're all crap. And um, he didn't laugh, no, not at all. And, um, 
Because, like for us, it seemed really obvious that whoever wrote those wasn't an employer and didn't even know an employer. They were written by academics. Now, you know, my wife is the DP of the college. She's an academic, so I'm not for one moment down on people with letters up. In fact, I was collared after a hui up in Kaikoui recently by a little lady about yay big, twisted my ear and said, you're too mean on people with degrees. And, and I, so, so I've thought about this really carefully. What I'm trying to say and what I say to youngsters is if the career path you've chosen requires a degree, then go and get one. But don't confuse having a degree with being more employable today. It's not the case. Canterbury needs 30,000 people in the next five years. They don't need more accountants and lawyers, trust me. They need people who can lay a road, fix a building. And uh, anyway, where was I? Um, yeah, so we, so we decided we would, we would do it differently because we said the community owns this polytech. And this is one of the principles. We believe all of the, most communities have the ingredients that we've got, schools, employers, young people, polytechs, all that. But what, usually what's lacking is a, is, a, is a community goal where you're all aiming at the same thing. Because sometimes you have to step outside your comfort zone and change the way you operate just a little bit to help achieve that ultimate goal. And the ultimate goal for us is employment for our kids. That's it. So we said to Wintech, those courses will not get, because you see, what employers say to me all the time is, you know, if a young person, like you take a year out of a kid's life and they get a certificate and they come in with a realistic expectation of, of getting a fair hearing in an interview and the employer looks at it and doesn't understand it and doesn't value it, how does that help the kid? It doesn't. So kids that go off and get a, you know, the certificate and blowing up balloons or staring into space or picking up rubbish, that's just a nonsense. So we don't do any of that. What we did was we got all the NZQA framework, spread it out on trestles, got our employers in, gave them beer and a pen and said, put, put um, marks beside the unit standards that kids need to have to be realistically considered by you. And that's what they did. And that's, that was our foundation courses. And that's what happened. We set up an employer partnership group. No courses are introduced in our Polytech without our employers signing them off. That's our, that's our community control on the partnership. And it works. They were very nervous at the start, but we're clever. You're not. How on earth can you tell us what to do? And we said, well, you know, think of it as a, as a bonus. You're getting a whole group of employers willing to work for nothing to help you in course development. What's bad about that? If you're serious about your vision of educating people into work. And it works, it really does. And then we do things like, um, you know, graduation ceremonies. You know, this is really, and this is kind of what drives me in some of the space. <clears throat> and I'll tell you a little story if I may. You remember, you know, I, like I failed everything in high school. I left home the same week I left school, so I was living away from mum and dad. And I was a rascal, and I found beer and women and cars, and it was brilliant. And, um, but I still passed my apprenticeship, you know, after four years. And I remember getting the certificate, my trade cert in the mail, it was in a brown envelope, it all been scrunched up in the postal service, and I remember opening it in my flat by myself, completely underwhelmed, thinking, man, is that it? Now, by contrast, my older brother Mark was ducks of Tiara College, UE accredited, he got all the brains in my family, mine as well, and, <laughs> and he went off to Auckland Uni and did a teaching degree, which was one year less than my apprenticeship, it was three years, not four. He passed, of course, and they got a march down Queen Street. Cap and a cape and they burnt couches and free beer and brilliant, you know? And I remember my mum and dad put on a party for my brother as the first person in our family to have got a degree. And it was a great party. But I remember as about a 19 year old thinking, what about me? I bloody worked hard. I'd come from further back. I really gutsed it out and I achieved. And here I am in business at, at, in three years time. I was in business, you know, made a lot of money employed a lot of people, retired early, and went on to become a mayor. And my brother didn't. No, I've let it go. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, those were the days when you had to stay on call for the department. He milked cows for my dad for two years. He's never taught in his life. Now, did that degree help him? The short answer is no. But, but society and parents and careers people and educators still get locked into this nuttiness around if you're average or half pie average, you should go and get a degree. What for? If education is there to prepare people for work. That's my, you know, shoot me down if you wish, but that's what I think. And you're planning to have me here. <laughs>
These four, can I just touch on these four things because like these are these are four of the real key programs that are that are buzzing along in our community now. First one is the Trade Center. I've talked about that. You know, a lot of these courses are just preparation for work. Work readiness is a term employers use a lot. You know, like kids who kids who legally can leave school on the day of their 16th birthday are generally a type of person. Probably don't have level two, probably don't have level one, probably don't have family support, probably been truants, probably got issues, you know? But, but they are the kids who are most likely to not leave town, and those are the kids who are most likely to be employed locally. So if they're gonna leave school at that, in that state and wander around aimlessly making dumb decisions, then they're gonna, they're gonna cause havoc in your town. That's what happens. The self-starters, the, the ones with tight families, the ones with options, they, they're going, you know? They, they, that's fine, and, and that's not an issue. But employers always say, those kids turning up on their 16th birthday for a job are, are prepared to that level. Their entry standard is at that level. There's a gap. In every community I've ever visited, there is a gap. Some of the, you know, the, the high decile communities, it's a very narrow gap. In the low decile, it's very wide, but there's always a gap. And as a community, we decided really early on, if we're going to own that gap by default, through negative frustration from young people, we might as well own it honestly. We might as well grunt into that space, put a hand up and say, we own it. And that's what we've done. This is Ray. <clears throat> we started, we employed him and started to write his job description and stop the camp mother, so that's all he is, he's camp mother. <laughs> and because, you see, because again, employers said to us, we're just not going, because our community goal started off to be a commitment to full employment for young people. We extended that two years ago to a commitment to full employment for all people because we think we're getting quite good at this now. But we said to employers, we need you to hire our kids, and they said, we're not going to. Hiring a, a young person, there's too much risk and too much liability. I don't believe that, but you won't change, you won't change an attitude. So we said, right, accepting that that's true, the community will employ a person and assign that person to that relationship when you employ the youngster for as long as it takes for free. That's it. That's why he's camp mum. Some of those relationships take a long time, some not long. His stats are showing now that it's between four and seven months on average. Not a long time in the terms of a business or a, or a, or a career, but it's essential. Because is it realistic for a 16-year-old to be employed and from day one be reliable, disciplined, and productive when they've never been inside a workplace because employers have shut off work experience and after school jobs and all this stuff so you know it's not fair on the kids to it throw them into that environment and expect them to to manage without assistance so that's what Ray's job is interestingly he now tells me that 60 percent of his energy goes into employers attitudes not the employees so go figure you know, he does, he runs weekly night classes. He has about 65 district apprentices. Our commitment to our apprentices and employers is when you employ a young person on a training agreement or an apprenticeship, the community will apply Ray, and our commitment, and I love one pages, I hate documents that are yay thick, is, is, his goal is that every young person on a training agreement will complete on time. That's it. There's not pages to hide behind, it's pretty simple. And this is why, because nationally across all trades, only a third of modern apprentices are completing today. Frankly, polys and unis aren't much better. It is a national disgrace how we take young people, charge them a fortune and their employers, sign them into a hokey agreement, and, and, and cull two-thirds of them. It's a disgrace. And five years is already one year longer than most agreements, so it's already a 25% slippage. The three, agriculture, forestry, and fishing, which you could argue are the backbone of Aotearoa's economy, nine out of 10 apprentices who sign a contract today will fail. Now this is on the internet, kids know that. So when mum and dad or the careers advisor says, go on, you should be a farmer, that, you know, that's the place to be now. Go and, and do your, your, ITO, your ag ITO apprenticeship. The kids go straight on, look at the internet and say, why the heck would I? You know, so we've got to stop kidding ourselves and the kids that we're giving them good advice because we really aren't. And simply we found those young apprentices need that sort of study support, pastoral care, I don't know what the true term is, but that's what we call it. 
Look what Ray's achieving, 96%. 96%. The 4% he doesn't get are kids who leave the country or leave the trade. Our commitment is everyone will pass. That's it. It's not, oh, well, 80% will pass. Every single one will. And we try and stop those ones from leaving the industry and leaving the country, but you can't win everything. Youth Centre, this is owned by a church. You know, the pastor came to see me and during one of those hui in 04 and said, Dale, we've got a lovely church out in the suburbs. We're down to 10 in the congregation. They've all got blue hair. We're just about stuffed. <laughs> but he said, like, what does Zodo need? I said, we need a youth centre. You're listening to these kids. He said, right, I'm going to sort that. So he got, he got approval from his 10 old dears and they sold their church, put the money into a redundant old picture theatre we got the kids in and says, like, what'll get you in here if you know it's a church and it won't freak you out? They said, rock climbing. So we spent 150 grand. We didn't know about rock climbing. Spent 150 grand on a rock wall. It's fantastic. During the week, it makes a lot of money with corporates and search and rescue training and camp um, cave guides and stuff. We have our kids in the afternoon, commercial kitchen, DVDs, music. The place goes off. Our manager there, Melissa, is a hip hop trained hip hop teacher. Well, you imagine what that does in a, in a Māori community with these youngsters who've got rhythm and, and, and they just love hip-hop. And on Sunday it shuts down, it's a church. The pulpit drops out of the wall, the vicar gets up and does his business. And, you know, it's like stairway to heaven, all the ropes are up. And <laughs> but you know, his average congregation on a Sunday is about 70 now, and about a half are people under 30. He's been co-opted onto his church board nationally because they've said, this is a living example of what churches were set up to do, serve their community. You know, I had a church group down from Thames on Tuesday who come down to have a look and they said, man, this is, you know, we've just built a church, but it's out in the suburbs and it's behind a fence and it was designed by adults and we're wondering why we're not getting kids in the door. I said, well, you know, ask yourself. So, so this place is really cool. School Leavers Connection Program, the pastor's wife actually is our connector. I realised we had all these kids churning out the school gate, and we had all these neat opportunities, but we had no connection. So we set up a connector, um, Carol gets all of the lever details in real time as the kids are jumping out the gate. She set up a database of all the agencies, employers, providers, anybody with an interest or, or an expertise to help young people. And she finds out from the youngsters within 14 days now here's where I go a bit off track with the new government model and I'm not going to go into it because um, you're taping this. Um, <laughs> but you know, our commitment is we don't pre-assess anybody as being potentially at risk. I hate that phrase. Every teenager I've ever met is at risk. Half the adults I meet are at risk frankly, but still. We look after every youngster as being a valuable resource who we love unconditionally. And we contact them immediately before they've made their first dumb decision or before, they, before they've had their first five sleep-ins in the morning and get to quite like it. And Carol says, like, what are you up to? The kids who know what they're doing, fine. She reconnects every three months till they're 19 and tells them that bottom line, that Ultranga loves them, we care about them, and anything that happens in the future, we need to know. And we're getting kids referring themselves back at 24, 25 years old because it felt good. And we're getting younger brothers and sisters. You know, like it's wicked. I mean, it seriously is cool. One of the first kids that came through this successfully was the local mongrel mob president's daughter. He lives just, just down my street. He tells everyone I live in his street, but we don't dispute that. And, <laughs> and like, but he's my age, you know, and he's got kids. And, and mum and his daughter, a real staunch kid, left school. Carol made contact. She said, nah, not interested. Leave me alone, all that. But every 14 days, reliably, Sometimes Carol forgets and these kids ring her and say, where's my call, you know? These, they are trainable, honestly. Anyway, it got to Christmas and Mama said, <clears throat> like, you know, I need money for Christmas, I need a job, but I bet you never help my sort of, my sort of kids, my sort of people. And as it happened, the supermarket had been in. This is what happens, you know, because it's local. The employers come to Carol and say, when you get someone suitable. So she takes her Mama down helps the interview, does all that stuff, because you can't send these kids down for an interview on their own. It just it won't happen. So anyway, she got a trial. She ended up working in the veggie department. After six months, she was manager of the veggie department. This is the Mangi president's daughter. She had a set of keys, so she was opening up in the morning without a brick. It was brilliant. And, <laughs> and like she ended up um, a sales rep for Coca-Cola, and she's wonderful. 
You know, she's one of my friends on Facebook. She's back in town now, married, raising, starting to raise a family, and she's lovely. Every time she sees me, it's a big cuddle. And her dad, you know, shakes my arm off when he sees me. And like, and, he's, and he says, you know, this is the first time in their memory, and they've been in town much longer than me, that the council has taken an interest and showed the same commitment to their kids as everybody else's. And like, I don't, it doesn't bother me, you know, like, I, I ride a Harley when me and my mates get together. We like our gangsters till we take our helmets off. And then, and then we just look old. Um, <laughs> but, you know, and, and Thomas has said to me regularly, he said, we will not stuff this up. And when I talk to the police about what the gang are up to, their, their constant response is they're under the radar. Doesn't mean they're not there and they're not. But, you know, they're all guys my age now, Thomas and his boys. They're all over 50. And... They party up, but it's all 60s music, and they have a big night, and they're in bed by half past nine. It's brilliant. <laughs> <coughs> We've got 12 programs running now, and, and every time we identify a gap, we just develop something. One of the principles I hope you take away from this, and I say to communities all the time, the longer communities sit back and say, we'd, we'd be doing better if the government only did blah de blah de blah or the council only did blah de blah de blah rubbish. Communities do this. Governments and councils can't. And if we did, it would cost you three times what anybody else could. You know, I say to communities, stop passing the buck. Look down that right-hand column. Council only features once, I think, there for the graduation ceremony, because it's a mural one. The rest are groups who are already in our community. Service clubs, government agencies, churches, Sports coach, except Marcus, and he comes into an hour, and that's his two-year program I hope he's told you about, which is really awesome. The college, business people, you know? <coughs> these people are all committed to our community goal, and this stuff really works. This is how it works. These are some of the results we've been achieving. We're just starting to gather the stats now. We've never been motivated by stats. It's about what's inside. The other thing, too, is we've never sat down and said, Let's apply for funds, and when we know how much money we've got, then we'll design what we're going to do. I hate that. We design what we're going to do first. We get on and do it, and we have the belief that the money will come. And you know it has. Only two of those programs receive any sort of government assistance. And our challenge is to get rid of the government out of those other two. And we will. We will. I'm not interested in handouts. We don't need it. Our community does not need more money. It needs less prescription and less bullshit from Wellington, but I suspect that won't happen, so we just have to just get on with it and just do it. Stable businesses. We haven't lost a single business through the recession, not a single one. We've gained two. Employers who came to us and said, we understand what you're doing. It's worth it coming here because of the support you give. No graffiti. I can't remember when we last had. We didn't talk about this, but it fell out the bottom quickly. You know, and... You know, when you get idiots that become ministers of local government like Rodney Hyde and Mick Smith, you know, that wander around saying council should stick to building roads and stay and stick to core business. This is core business. We have a ten year long term plan and my people say we want our we want nobody left behind in my communities. We want our people looked after. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Cool, that's my mandate. And look at the results. This is better than building roads. More fun. Our youth crime, look, they dropped 75% in the first two years of these programs starting. 75%. When you come to Odo now, and I know you will after this, you know, we've got lovely hanging baskets in the main street. We've been there 10 years. Kiwiana, we're the Kiwiana capital of the world now. Icons, and we've got group, community groups, just working feverishly, designing and creating things, because they can, and they don't get trashed. The kids aren't interested in that stuff anymore. They just don't care. They're working, and they're on a pathway, and they're being supported. I like that, that bizzo from Victor Hugo. Somebody sent it to me one day, and I think that's what we do without really knowing it. You know? And, I, and I, I kind of like it. Can everybody see that? Everybody read that? Jolly good. And you know, this is the economic stuff behind this, for those who are e economists. This is Burl, an independent group of real clever people with lots of letters after their name. They assess all 
councils every year on a set of nine KPIs around economic performance. That, that's what they said in the middle of the recession. That was what the quote from page five was. The biggest climber was us. Remarkably climbed forward. We leapfrogged over <coughs> councils who consider themselves desirable and go ahead. The only thing we did differently was we looked, made our employers more attractive to our youngsters and made our youngsters more attractive to our employers. That's all we did. That's all we did. And look at that. I mean, that is cool. Nick Smith, are you around? Oh, no, he's gone. <laughs> but compared to New Zealand Inc., you know, like there's 90 or 87,000, I think, young people not in employment, education or training wandering around Aotearoa right now. You know? But yet, in December 07, I was at Parliament with the Mayor's Task Force for Jobs having a beer with the ministers of the day celebrating the fact there was less than 250 under 25-year-olds on an unemployment benefit. So for the people my age who wander around saying this generation doesn't know how to work, that's not true. When there's jobs, they work. And in fact, Student job search, Paul Kennedy told us the other day that New Zealand is currently leading the OECD countries in youth volunteer hours worked. They've realised a degree is, gets them in the door, <laughs> then the employer says, what experience have you had? If they can't get it paid, they're getting it unpaid. So that blows that myth out that this generation doesn't know how to work. It's not true. But they do need certain things to make it happen. Lots of real clever people are saying we have to do better in this space. I'm sure you've read some of this stuff. There's a couple I want to touch on because this has really shaped this for me in the last six months. Please, this could be edge of your seat stuff. It is for me. This is Professor Natalie Jackson, Waikato University. She's just finished a four-year demographic research. You can Google it. It's all online. She made the comment presented at Youth and Local Government Conference in Invercargill a couple of months ago. She basically commented that the world's population peaked in 1962, 100 years after a significant decrease in infant mortality rate. So that sets the scene worldwide. In New Zealand, in the next 15 years, that over 65 age group will increase by 61%. All other age groups, only 5.4. Councils, in 96, 15 years ago, only 4% of our 67 councils had more people over 65 than under. Last year, that was 41%. In the next 15 years, that's every single council in New Zealand will have more old people than young. Now, this is the elephant in the room. For people my age, all we're concerned about is who's going to write out the super check in 10 or 15 years' time. That's all we care about, okay? For councils, what we're worried about is how do we, knowing that, how do we provide 30 foot wide footpaths for mobility scooters in our communities with a flat track to the doctor and the RSA and there's nobody working in our businesses and paying rates to pay for it? That's, for, that's council. But what I'm saying to employers is run out of this room now and sign up some of these 87,000 kids on a training agreement because when you want them in five years, they've gone and they're never coming back. Not just they've gone to Aussie. You see Aussie now coming out here, running seminars. You only have to turn up at the airport with a toothbrush and you're done. <laughs> you don't even have to get your visa sorted. These countries are already hitting the ground running for young people, and we're not. We're still in the, locked in the mindset that we're doing kids a favour by giving them a job. We're still in this mindset of how do we... And look, I've said to the Mayor's Task Force for Jobs, our first 12 years, our vision has been the zero waste, our goal has been the zero waste of youth. The next 12, in my humble opinion, it'll be how we deal with the zero supply of youth. And we won't be, we won't be concentrating on how we find jobs for our young people, it'll be how we find young people for our jobs. And I said to a group of employers last night, who were a fractious group of old farts, and they were going, oh, well, we'd employ more young people if youth rates came back. And I said, well, good. I said, I predict that in five years, youth rates will be back. And they all went, oh, well, that's great then. Well, we'll just wait. I said, yeah, but it won't be $2 an hour under adult rates. It'll be $10 an hour over. And they went, oh. <laughs> well, you know, understand that. Because kids have got options. They've got options. They don't have to work on a farm for 90 hours a week and live in a portacom on the back section or, or wear overalls on minimum wage. They don't have to. They don't have to. And I suspect 
cities like Brisbane and Sydney and Melbourne in five years' time will actually be flying people out from Ultrahonga for five days a week to work and flying them back for the weekend. I suspect that's what will happen. It will just be a cost of... Because, you see, at the moment there's a lot of 65 pluses still in the workforce because they lost a lot of money in the, in the financial crash and the interest rates are so low it's not, it's not livable. But in the next 10 years when the reality of a frail body kicks in and people, whether they want to or not, have to leave the workforce... Who's going to take their place? So who's going to run the factories and the mills? Who's going to milk the cows? Who's going to buy the businesses? That's, that's the elephant in the room that nobody's really locked into. And Natalie put it, that was her conclusion. Youth will be more sought after, harder to find, and more expensive to secure from now on. So my message to communities and employers is for your own survival, Get off your backsides and invest in your future workforce. Harvard <coughs> report, you know, this is quite good. This came out in February 2011, where they are challenged themselves with, um, they concluded that of the 47 million new jobs appearing in the United States in the next eight years, only a third require a bachelor's degree, but their only pathway for secondary school for youth development and into employment is via high school. So they're churning out 25-year-olds with a massive debt, no chance of a job, and people with degrees are flipping burgers at McDonald's. And the people who normally would be flipping burgers at McDonald's are on the scrap heap. So they're challenging themselves, and this is what they concluded. <coughs> the first is developing a broader vision that, that embraces multiple pathways. Well, I like to think New Zealand's on that track. You know, the five new pathways that Anne Tolley brought out, Trades academies, skills academies, gateway, they are great. And what you're doing is great. You know, like there's, I think there's enough awareness in that space that I'd like to think we put a partial tick in that. The middle one, and this is what I'm finding as I travel around the country, there is a massive appetite now from all of those players, educators, <coughs> trainers, providers, government agencies, young people and employers to sit around the table and at least have the conversation about how they do better. Because there's enough vested interest now and enough pressure on each of those sectors from whatever source to do better. Employers need to, this is what Harvard said, employers need to play a greater role in providing opportunities and pathway support for their employees. And I've touched on that before about work experience, cadetships, if communities won't employ people like Ray, then some of these big businesses need to. When I started in the motorcycle industry, every garage had a guy in the 60s, the granddad who looked after us Harry's and, you know, kept us out of mischief and it didn't really work, but anyway, he was supposed to, and he taught us the intricacies of the trade until we got to that point where we were reliable and productive. And the third thing, and this is important too, which is what the task force really works hard at, this need to develop a social compact between society and young people. I'm astounded how many communities I've invited into, and the opening line is, Dale, we've asked you here because we've got a problem with our young people. They're trouble, they're potential criminals, they boy races, they do all this stuff, we hate it, we're sick of it, we need your help to fix them. I say, well, if that's your attitude, and that's the attitude of this community, see you later. I'm not interested. They're not to be fixed. They're to be supported better for better outcomes. And the societies who are getting with that program and understanding that, that they need to do better for the young people, they are really making inroads in the space. I just dug this up the other day because this was something from a hui. Sorry to overload you with stats and that, but I figured you're all educated, clever people. Um, you could get this. This is what you at Keep, who came out last year <coughs> to New Zealand, and, and some of this is really interesting because it was probably a year too early when he presented it. Nobody got it but, it, but they get it now. He's saying that, you know, there's real big shifts in the employment market, preference for older workers, immigration, casualisation, and the need for workers who can manage themselves between multiple jobs and locations. That's what he, this was his international research. And he went on to say that for young people, there's a quantitative problem, as in not enough jobs, and qualitative, and that is much of the work that there is is insecure, pays badly, and offers little opportunity for progression. So for a young person, those three things are really important. 
And he went on to say that there's two policy approaches that, you know, this is what can done, be done to arrest that. We can either raise the family and young people's aspirations and their desire to achieve an education, or we can improve the quantitative and qualitative levels of demand from the labour market. And I sense for a long time, and even now, I see Hekia Parada said the other day that they want to improve level two from 68% to 85. Now, in my experience, you get alongside a 16-year-old who's been a truant and disengaged in school and say to him, I'm your new best friend and my job is to get you back to school for level two. All you've done is put his or her foot on the throttle. For a lot of those kids, a job is more realistic. Level two might be the ideal aspiration, but is it real for that kid? But what you had said was, is beginning to emerge a realisation that it actually is easier to change the aspirations towards education and young people if those employment opportunities were improved. In other words, putting the, putting the horse before the cart, because we seem to be focused on getting their education better for better jobs, you were just saying, and I tend to agree, the employers and the employment market, and I suspect this pressure from that youth deficit will put pressure on them making better use of the flexibility in their workplace which will encourage young people to educate themselves better. It's early days, but I suspect that was quite revolutionary when he said it. I suspect it was a year too early. So that's all the why. I'm, I'm getting to the end because you'll have questions, hopefully, or else morning tea, afternoon tea. Um, a lot of communities say, Dale, well, that's all brilliant in Otaranga. There's you there, and it's a small town, and it's different in our community, and that will never work. What is what you what is your journey actually look like for us to take away, digest, and maybe maybe make something of it? These are the key things that we've discovered, that we've put down on paper to say this is important. The local solutions for local issues, community leadership and ownership is paramount in my view. If the community isn't prepared to step up and demand better outcomes and commit where necessary to making it happen, we will always get what we've got. Because employers, educators, trainers, providers, agencies will do their very best and do. But they will stop short where their funding agreement or their KPIs or their comfort level or their energy levels permit. And sometimes in this space you have to go beyond that occasionally to just make it really happen. Employment is the ultimate goal for all young people. That's my view. And that's supported. The Mayor's Task Force for Jobs is the only Mayor's only organisation in New Zealand. We don't have a Mayor's Task Force for boy races or graffiti. Jobs is the only thing we've consistently agreed on year in, year out since the year 2000. And it's still relevant. But as I said before, it's no longer about how do we find jobs for kids, it's how do we find kids for jobs. But the mahi will still be the same. Stock taking of communities, understanding what the job requirements available for young people tomorrow and the next day are. That is critical. If the finishing tape is a job, we need to know what the employer's expectations are. It's really simple. But so few people know. A lot of these big employers have got a head office in Singapore or Wellington. Managers come and go. They get their, they get their employment recruitment now through immigration or contracting out or HR or work, workplace work-based schemes, they don't have to employ locals. But if, if your community wants them to, then there's things the community has to do to bridge that gap, to, to take ownership of some of those issues. Transitional support for school leavers, that's essential in my view. Post-secondary training, your space, focusing on work readiness and skills that employers recognise and value. And again, that's easy to identify once that relationship with employers is gained and you understand what jobs they have coming up. And all employers know that. And they'll share it with you when they realise you're serious. They won't share it on the first visit, though. Support for employers and of youth and young employees. That's essential. The attrition rate for that fresh relationship is too great to ignore. And valuing communities, valuing their young people and celebrating the achievements is simple. It's really simple. But it's, you know, it's media reports. Go into any, and I do it everywhere I go. You, first thing I do is get their local paper and have a read. 
The first three letters will be something negative about young people. There'll be two or three advertisements, you know, the court news and things like that in the paper. Where's the good stuff? You know, where's the, where's the youngster chopping firewood for the neighbour? Where's the, you know, where's the kids in the production or that have just given an award? The stuff is there, but somebody's got to go and dig it out and jam it down the media's throat and write the, write the press releases if necessary and make it happen. Because it's really important. If kids don't believe their community puts any sort of value in them, then they will exercise their frustrations any old way. That's the flow chart, youth to work strategy we call it, in the absence of one. We're the only OECD country in the world now that doesn't have an agreed commitment by all political leaders across three-year election cycles, across all parties, that says actually jobs for our kids is quite important, which is really sad. I don't know how we keep up, but John Key's 10-point action plan recently didn't mention young people and jobs. You know, the budget didn't mention young people and jobs. I just don't get it. I think they're gonna claim credit in the next 10 years when that 87,000 needs disappears, but it's not because of anything anybody's doing. It's a worldwide phenomenon. It's a worldwide vacuum cleaner. So that's what it looks like. That sort of stuff's available for those communities who want to make a step. Andrew Beecroft, Principal Youth Court Judge. I love that because that's what he firmly believes. He sees this stuff every day. It's true, isn't it? I mean, it doesn't matter what age you are. If you've got routine self-esteem and income in your life on the same day, that's not bad, is it? You know? So is it wrong to want that for our kids? I know we want it for our own kids, but is it wrong to want it for our neighbours' kids? 